And welcome back, everybody. We're talking to San Diego CEOs and business leaders. And today we've got another great one. We've got the CEO and founder of Seekster, Artie Aryanpour, is here this morning. Artie, what's happening? Bob, good morning from San Diego, California. I hope you're doing well. And thanks so much for having myself on Market Knowledge with yourself. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, we're going to have a lot of fun, and I think the the things that you have to say, your message, is really going to help a lot of people as well. So really appreciate you being here today. Why don't we start, maybe set the stage for us a little bit on Seekster. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, Seekster is a startup that I founded in 2016. Um, I came from a very heavy clinical diagnostics and genomics background. Being from San Diego, I guess that's not a surprise, but... Um, since we're the mecca of genomics, I was at the right place at the right time um, and learned a few tricks on what not to do in businesses and always, you know, was striving for building, you know, small little company myself. And in 2016, you know, jumped right in and built um, and pioneered um, what I call patient centric or person centric interoperability where we're putting the person at the center of their healthcare, smashing all the data silos from your medical records to your DNA information, ancestry information, wearable information, um, and putting it all into a longitudinal health record. And that's what we uh, filed patents on back in 2016 for a multi-generational health record because I wanted to get my grandmother's data, my mom's data, and my data as a family record to pass on the generations. A whole bunch more questions about that. But first, let's talk a little bit about your journey on how, how you got here. Um, I think the story goes, you came to San Diego when you were five or six years old from Iran? Yeah, so I was born in Tehran, Iran. I was born in the Iran-Iraq war. So definitely have some scars and stars, whichever way you want to look at it. But um, uh, if I didn't have you know, my immigration story, Seekster would not exist. Um, definitely owe a lot of that to, you know, my dad taking the risk of getting us out of the country and getting us as far west as possible. And that was San Diego, California. I landed in San Diego in 1986 and I was actually six years old. I didn't learn English till I was nine. I'm 41 now, but, um, I'm nine years behind because I really didn't get to, you know, have an opportunity to learn, you know, until I was nine because it took it took me three years almost to to learn English. I'm still so, learning. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't mind, I just want to dig a little deeper on that. You know, what was it like growing up in San Diego from Iran and? You know, all of a sudden you've got to learn a new language. Your parents have to learn a whole new culture and lifestyle. And I'm sure at times that that probably wasn't easy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, imagine being an alligator like you and I look totally differently. Well, when I when I was growing up, I didn't have this, you know, mainly beard, I guess, since I've <laughs> grown it in COVID now and kept it. But, um, uh, you know, imagine if you had to go grow up, you know, in a foreign country. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine if we took places and you were growing up somewhere in the Middle East. It's definitely not easy. And being a minority, I think you have to know how to embrace America. And I learned how to do that at a young age. And so, um, you know, I grew up in Scripps Ranch. We were the only non-white family in Scripps Ranch. And, um, you know, it, but I never felt that... I didn't belong because my parents really instilled the fact that we were American when we landed here. Right. And I think that was so important. And so, you know, um, I'm a perfect example of the American dream being alive yeah. because we came here family of four with not even $10,000 and everyone in my family has been super successful and entrepreneurial. And um, it's only because of the struggles and everything that we had to live uh, behind and have to start all over 
you know, that resets you. But then that makes you work harder. That makes you want to give back more. And um, it was cool, you know, being different and having a name such as myself. Artie Ariampour is definitely a tongue twister. It's not, <laughs> it's not, you know, John Smith or, you know, Stacy Lee, right? So, um, but, um, you know, getting involved in sports, getting involved in community, getting involved with um, just um, various different outreaches allowed, I guess, myself to just grow. And I was always an extroverted person, so I was never shy. And I probably should have been shy, um, but I wasn't. I was actually the opposite. And so um, it was, um, it was, it definitely had an impact to everything I do. And you realize it more as you get older because you tap into your young self. And I think if you can do that, it's a very powerful tool. So do you, when you, you know, we all experience setbacks, different things that happen throughout the day, week, year, whatever. Do you tap into to some of that, what you went through to kind of get through and say, Hey, I can, I can manage this. No problem. Oh yeah. I mean, I've, I have, I mean, I have walked through fire. <laughs> you don't want to know what my journey has been. Um, I've, I've walked through fire multiple times. You know, as I say, I have my stars from lots of success, you know, being very successful at a young age, but I also have my scars and I put more value on my scars than my stars because I wouldn't have any stars if I didn't have scars. I really do believe you have to go through some sort of, you know, path of suffering in order to appreciate and become successful. And my failures, I always say, are what made me a success. Yeah, fantastic. I love it. I mean, otherwise, how would you know, right? You have to have something to base it off of. So, uh, so that's great. So, um, so as your journey continues there, you, you get into uh, the biotech industry here in San Diego. And, you know, being here from six years old, you're, you're a native, of course. Um, tell me about how you got from biotech executive to now with Seekster kind of jumping in all into the entrepreneurial realm. Yeah. So it actually really started when I was 16, when I got a job at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. That was the first time I experienced the power of science, but I always had business in my own DNA and I wanted to mix business and science together and people weren't doing that. And so, you know, I almost went down the wrong path because I was pre-med at University of California, Irvine, when I, where I did my um, biological sciences studies. And I never made it to medical school. I think my ADHD didn't allow me to do well on the MCAT. I failed it multiple times. And then I said, oh my God, like I'm graduating. I need to figure out what I'm gonna do. So I jumped in, I went through 42 different interviews, was denied 42 times until the 43rd interview and I got myself my first sales and marketing job at the age of 22 back in 2002. And that was with a company that was selling injectable drugs to hospitals and pharmacies. Um, I, I don't know, I was rookie of the year. I blew the numbers out of the park my first year at 22. Um, I think one month back in 2002, I made, I don't know, over $12,000 in commission. And I realized, oh my God, you can make a living by doing good as well as selling products. And so I started scratching my head thinking, how do I get into biotech? Because I really wasn't in biotech yet. But that job allowed me to get into biotech sales. And then I got into international business development in my mid-20s. By my late 20s, I became an executive in biotech, landed at a startup, and um, was instrumental in building one of the world's largest clinical diagnostics organizations and then selling that company for a billion dollars to um, the sovereign fund of Japan, then Konica Minolta. 
So you mentioned going through 40 plus interviews. How did you, and you've got this certain energy about you. So I'm just you know, curious on what goes through your mind. How do you go to 35 and say, and not say, Hey, is this, is this right for me? You know, um, how did you know, you know, kind of in your head, this, this is the path I gotta, I gotta keep on. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> it's kind of like I relate it to, so I, I ran track in high school and I have the actin three gene, which is the sprinter gene, same gene as Usain Bolt, but I'm not as fast as him, obviously. <laughs> I wish I was, he's got way better genetics, but he's yeah. definitely an idol of mine. Um, uh, you know, um, I, I, I relate it to, to sports because it's like, as soon as you lose, you gotta get up and try harder. And if you have that mentality, you know, while playing soccer when I was young, while playing tennis when I was young competitively, while playing football while I was young competitively as well, um, I, it, it, it teaches you a special sauce. And that special sauce is you can win. It just takes time. And if you put in the work and effort, and obviously you got to have passion, that's the key. If you can do that, then you will get to your final destination. And I always have a plan A. I call it plan Artie, actually. I've had this from a young age. I don't have a plan B. Anytime I've always been in business meetings, even at a young age, with executives that were 20, 30 years older than me, they'd always say, well, our plan B and plan C is this. And I would interrupt them telling them, there's no plan B or plan C. And they would look at me like I'm crazy. But I just have a different vision because I've had different experiences. And there's only been one plan A. Ever since we landed in the US, there was no plan B. Yeah, We couldn't, we, our plan B wasn't going to Canada or Mexico. It was to get to the United States of America right. for opportunity. And you got to have, you know, you got to be hungry. I think a lot of people, you know, want to do things, but they're not hungry. And I've been starving. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm still starving and I have a wonderful company, a wonderful life. And that's because... I think of myself as an underdog because I well, am, I truly am. Now, you know, um, my family, my wife, my mom, everyone would maybe disagree, disagree about this. Oh, no, you're not an underdog anymore. Come on. No, I, I think I'm actually more of an underdog because the expectations that you set for yourself are always, you know, um, much higher than what others set for yourself. Well, I, and I agree about not having a plan B. And I hear that a lot from people that I that I talk to and interview on this podcast. It's, it's almost like when you're fully committed, you know, 100% committed to whatever plan it is, the universe has a way of, you know, directing you into the right place at the right time. It might not be on your time, right? But it'll be on, it'll happen. You just got to stay healthy. You got to stay hungry and you got to stay alive and you will thrive. That is what I have learned. Talk to me about Seekster now. And for the the regular guy like me who uh, is not in the health business, but follows mm -hmm. it. Now, I, I have some family that has some health issues. So I, I've, I've kind of maybe I understand it pretty well. But um, talk to me about Seekster. Yeah, look, Seekster is so special. I can't tell you how special it is. Um, not because I'm the CEO and, and founder of Seekster, but it's special because we impact patient lives at scale. We have pioneered out of thin air <laughs> a technology where now we are backed by Takeda Pharmaceuticals, 23andMe's and Wajiki, number one female entrepreneur and um, CEO of, of 23andMe, um, as well as Omni Health Holdings, which was part of United Healthcare Group under um, the Equian acquisition. So um, we're, we are really excited 
about what we've created. It took a long time getting back to the time thing. In 2016, when I founded the company, people thought we were crazy. What, you're gonna build something that's gonna connect the wearable data, fitness data, the provider data, the genomic and DNA data? How's that even possible? That's not possible. 2017, we started getting some calls. In 2018, that's when everything changed. Everything changed when Bill Gates actually contacted me and wanted to meet because like I said, um, my maternal and paternal grandmothers were suffering from Alzheimer's disease. And my paternal grandmother passed away a couple years before I started Seekster. My maternal grandmother, who was my number one fan and who was living off of Park Boulevard um, uh, ever since we migrated you know, to the US in the 80s, uh, got hit hard with Alzheimer's, and that's when I realized at the beginning stages of building Seekster that we needed to figure out this multi-generational health record. So that's how I actually file patents. I give my grandmother all the credit because she lives within the matrix of our wonderful engineering team that has coded you know, 7 million lines of code in order to standardize and harmonize all this data and make a 360 patient view so that you can see all of your health data in one place and share it on your terms. So we were the first to do that. If you look at when we founded the company, when we filed our patents, there's a lot of vaporware out there you know, even in San Diego, even in the Bay Area, even in, in New York and, and across, you know, the pond in, in Europe. Um, but people are looking at Seekster, you know, um, with a magnifying glass because everyone wants to learn how we did it. Right. <laughs> and yeah. as soon as we were able to have our breakout year, which was 2019 and generate, you know, millions of dollars of revenue, that's when the big investors came. And we completed a $12 million Series A with, you know, top 10 pharma company. And uh, that changed everything in, in 2020. And in 2021, we have added, uh, you know, a dozen new com customers. And um, what's the reaction been? I know this is person centric, so I can control my own data and I put in what I want and, and let who sees it, who I, who I have to approve that. I imagine uh, what's the, is there a challenge there with people saying, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm trying to protect my privacy. I can see that as maybe being one of the challenges. Yeah. So number one, we're HIPAA compliant. Number two, we are FDA compliant. We got our FDA 21 CFR part 11 compliant letter after working with the FDA and and, and Big Pharma uh, for about 19 months. And that was uh, uh, announced uh, October, September, October of last year, 2020. So, um, and we're 256 bit encrypted and uh, we're more secure than even let's say Scripps <laughs> who just got hacked, right? It's, yeah. it's actually world news. Right. Um, why? Because 3 million people in San Diego, they go to, let's say, Scripps, just the number, maybe it's less than 3 million, but I don't know, it's maybe 2 million. Yeah. Um, no one really knows the numbers anymore because the consensuses aren't really correct on how many people are in the city, but majority of people have Scripps as the provider. Um, their information got hacked. Why? Because there's one encryption key for the whole database. But with Seekster, when let's say XYZ Pharma Company licenses our platform and then launches it to their million COVID patient clinical trial, there's a million encryption keys. And so we've built that privacy and security as the pillar, you know, with pharma. And um, our business model is B to B to C. We're a healthcare SaaS platform where we're paving the road for digital health and digital health has exploded because of the pandemic. Right, right. I've heard you describe it as 
like a, a mint or, and then on the commercial side, like a, a license to Salesforce type of relationship. Wow. You're, you're, you're doing your research. That's pretty good. Um, <laughs> you, you should be pitching Seekster, not me. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. So it actually, I, you know, we came up with the idea because once um, uh, we had some, I guess, wealth to manage, we are using personal capital and mint and, you know, for finance information, bringing your Wells Fargo Bank of America student loans in one place is not that hard because all finance inter information is, is zeros and ones. Health yeah. data is complex. Mm -hmm. Your name in at UCSF is different than in UCSD. It might say B dot McGriff instead uh -huh. of Bob underline McGriff. So imagine how vitamin D or vitamin K is ca characterized. Yeah. And then when you get to the DNA data, the DNA data is not even within your medical records. Your wearable data doesn't exist in there. So we really created, you know, um, a one-stop shop, one site, one login platform that gets white labeled for both mobile and web for any enterprise in healthcare. Now, what's really interesting is we can make any company a digital health company. And because of the pandemic, everyone is interested in this. Even real estate companies are calling us saying, hey, we want to give your service to our employees as a corporate wellness program. So the opportunities are, you know, sky's the limit here with Seekster. And that's what's really interesting. On the business side, you're absolutely right, Bob. We have nailed the salesforce.com business model. The biggest problem in digital health and in healthcare is most people don't know how to actually monetize and create a business model. What we did differently is we said, forget about the business model. Let's focus, laser focus on that plan A. And plan A was give patients complete ownership and control of their data and let them share that data on their terms. And then we'll build a platform around it. And yeah. so I always say everyone is seeking health data. It doesn't matter if you're Bob, it doesn't matter if you're my grandma who passed away. It doesn't matter if you're Bill Gates. It doesn't matter if you're Pfizer. Everyone is seeking health data. That's why we created Seekster. Everyone's a Seekster. Right, right. As you grow and hire more employees, you know, a lot of people are saying these days that the way that we work is changing a little bit. You know, a lot of people are working from home. If you've got internet, you know, you can you can do your job for a lot, of, especially in some some of the high tech companies. Yeah. What's what's your thoughts on that? As as you hire talent from San Diego and, and around the country. Uh, are you going to see more people in the office? Or are you going to see more people remote or, or hybrid of that? I think it depends. If you're some big corporate organization, it's going to be hybrid. If mm -hmm. you're a startup, most likely you're going to make the decision based off of the use cases in your business. At the same time, you know, I don't know. I mean, the CEO really, um, determines that culture. Yeah. And if I'm telling you as the CEO and, and, and chairman of Seekster, I'm telling you that face-to-face -face is super important. You can't beat face-to-face. -face. The Zooms and the Google Meets and the you know Skypes and Microsoft Teams that we're all doing one after another, I think it's caused a lot of burnout for everyone. However, that being said, we got more done because of the way that you don't have to get on a plane and meet and greet. That being said, last week I was in Las Vegas and the only reason why I went was because right before that, um, I got hit with the Delta variant. I'm fully vaccinated by Pfizer mm -hmm. and unfortunately had 16 very painful days. I was one of the first breakthrough cases and I probably wouldn't have gone to Vegas for the big healthcare conference known as HIMSS, it's the big health IT conference, um, if I didn't have that. Now, we were all masked up the whole time. We had to show our vaccine card. And if we follow certain rules, 
then I think you're going to be better off than not. Are you 100% protected? Of course not. Do you want? Do people want to go sit in an office with coworkers? You don't know who's vaccinated, who's not. I think it's complicated. COVID is here to stay. We yeah. have to adapt and you know understand how we can work in this new environment. The people who who will ad adapt will thrive. The people who won't, unfortunately, will either die because they're not vaccinated. And um, they just will fall behind because they won't be able to adapt to the new situation. Artie, thanks so much for being here today. You dropped some just incredible messages on us and continued success with Seekster and uh, really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Bob. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure spending time with you. And I feel like you knew Seekster better than me. So um, thank you again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Johnny. Appreciate it. Look forward to talking again real soon. Great. See you soon. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>